So uh, we'll get started. The topic of my lecture today uh, is our sharing is make your immune and, um, immune system stronger than ever. So this will be about a, a, a forty minute uh, sharing, and then afterwards we'll do a question and answer. And um, to facilitate the flow of the lecture, maybe we can. Um, if you have any questions, please leave them till the end, and then we can go back and forth on the slides. All right, so I'll be going over the, the outline first. Okay, uh, we'll be talking about lifestyle, food, sleep, hydration, exercise, posture and balance, and mental health. Okay, so we'll get started. The first one is lifestyle. Okay, what is a health, healthy lifestyle? A healthy lifestyle simply means doing things that make you sustainably happy and feel good. So it's important to see there, it's sustainably happy and feeling good. So happy is different from uh, just having pleasure because pleasure is temporary. You know, like it only appeals to the senses. Happy talks about something that's, that will last longer. And feeling good, so we associate this with well-being. And well-being is about feeling strong and capable of doing all of the things that you want to do. So how do, you, how do you maintain a healthy lifestyle? First, you have to avoid habits and activities that contradict these as much as possible. So for example, like for me, um, what I used to think makes me happy is when I drink uh, whiskey. So, because for a long time, that's what my patients would give me, <laughs> whiskey as gifts. And I, I used to really enjoy it, but I realized that it, it's not sustainable at all. Um, it'll make me feel nice for a time, but then the next day I'm usually hungover and I, I feel very unhealthy. So, Although it made me, what I thought it made me feel happy, but it was really just a temporary sensory pleasure. So when, if, when you're trying to assess if you're having, a, if you have a good lifestyle or not, you have to see, will it sustainably for a long period of time make you feel happy and feel good? So uh, the key words there are sustainable, happiness and well-being. And remember, there's a very big difference between happiness and pleasure. Pleasure is always just temporary. Be mindful of what you think, say, and do. Is it sustainable? Ask yourself that. Number two, will it make me and my loved ones happy? Remember that happy is long-term. Will it improve my sense of well-being? Um, you know, like I used to super enjoy watching Netflix, and I still do. But sometimes if uh, I, I would marathon until about two, three in the morning. So it feels nice while I'm watching it. But then the next day I become very sluggish. I don't sleep well because it's only like maybe three hours. So the next day I'm not my best at work and I don't perform well. And it's not good for my, I don't get to have time to play with my son be with my wife, and I don't perform well for my patients. So it was temporary. That's why I, as much as possible now, I, I do my cut off of uh, watching my TV shows at about 10 p.m. at the latest. And then I go to sleep. Okay. So, you know, this could, a healthy lifestyle is subjective. It means different things to everyone. But the universal things, you know, the, the, the things that are really essential for a healthy lifestyle is, is it sustainable? Will it give you lasting happiness, not just temporary pleasure? And will it make you feel physically good? All right, let's move on. Okay, this, uh, um, you know, usually each, if we go back here, um, on our overview, we have lifestyle, food, sleep, hydration, exercise, posture and balance, and mental health. Normally, you would have about one whole semester for each one of this one to seven. 
But since today we only have 40 minutes, we have to try to compress. Um, because, you know, like, for example, just the topic of food alone could already take one semester. So um, I, I just tried my best to condense it as much as possible. Move on, back to food. Okay, food, minimize sugar as much as possible. It is more dangerous than smoking. So now the, the thing with sugar is uh, we recognize it now as the, a, the, a bigger problem than smoking. It's bigger than sitting down too long. It's a bigger problem than um, any other bad habit. Because, you know, um, the companies, manufacturers just keep on feeding us sugar, you know, and because we are primarily hardwired to seek out sugar, um, our bodies feel good when we have sugar, but it's very temporary. Okay, so high sugar diets are known to cause diabetes, which leads to many systemic illness like cancer. And so for if you've encountered people that have had cancer, and I know some in our group here now has had it, or possibly, God forbid, have it, um, you know that your oncologist, if you have cancer, will always restrict your sugar. Because sugar will make spikes in your metabolism that feed the cancer growth to grow much faster and larger. High sugar diets give poor energy quality and delay healing. So when you take the sugar, it feels good for a time, but very quickly you get the sugar crash and then you don't feel as good. So sugar, the reason why sugar has now been associated to be almost more dangerous, if not as dangerous as taking drugs is because you get addicted to sugar. Sugar is very, very, very addicting. And it might, not, um, it, it might not make you sick in one day, but because of its availability, it, you, you know, it can make you very, very sick in just a few years. So high sugar diets give poor energy quality and delay healing. Now, the reason why it delays healing is because when there's a lot of sugar in your body, sugar is fuel. And when there's a lot of fuel in your body, you'll want to spend it. it. It keeps you in a fight or flight situation. So when you are in a fight or flight, your body can't heal. So the longer you have sugar very high in your bloodstream, none of your repair mechanisms in your body can really work. Everything is slower in, in terms of repair when you have high sugar content in your blood. Um, next is, this also means minimizing carbohydrates. Uh, here in the Philippines, we have, or in Asia in general, we have way too much sugar. Uh, there's sugar in everything. And, you know, even our spaghetti is uh, famous all around the world as being the sweetest spaghetti on the planet. Um, someone once asked me what, Someone once told me that the ingredients for Filipino spaghetti is sugar with some tomato sauce and some noodles. So that's, that's, that's really terrible news. Um, okay, so now we know we shouldn't have too much sugar. Um, in fact, even if you cut sugar altogether, your body can make its own sugar. So if you could completely cut sugar better. Eat more high quality protein that is easily digestible. Fish and bone broth is a great source. So um, like even in my, my, my time in New York, when I was still uh, just in my postgrad, um, there was a big craze in Manhattan, which is uh, bone broth. I think it was something like $12 per cup. And then when I finally tried it, it was just nilaga. It's just nilagang baka. And then I investigated further on why there was such a bone broth craze. And it's still it's starting to come to the Philippines now. Um, because bone broth has all of the proteins and amino acids that you need without any difficulty in digestion. Because, you know, when we get older, it becomes a little bit harder to digest, to digest food. So that's why um, adding bone broth to your diet 
will fulfill almost all of your pro uh, protein and amino acid requirements. Fish is also a very good source, but there is a bit of a caveat uh, because if you take too much fish, um, well, there have been, um, it's quite proven now that fish has um, a lot of mercury and can cause heavy metal toxicity. That's why in our clinic, in our other clinic before in BGC, there was a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of chelation that's done. So if, you, if you're not familiar with chelation, chelation is the process of removing heavy metal toxicity in the body. Um, because, you know, like deep sea fish is very high in um, mercury and that is toxic to the body and has been associated with higher incidence of dementia and other neural problems. Okay, next. Um, yeah, eat cruciferous vegetables because they are high in antioxidants that prevent cancer and dementia. So cruciferous vegetables, these are your broccolis and your cauliflower, They're very, very high in antioxidants. And see, the nice thing about antioxidants is it's like a magnet. It acts like a magnet to toxins and heavy metals. So if you have any of that floating around in your body, the antioxidants grab onto it and it takes it with it as you poop it out. So yeah. You need antioxidants to clean up your body because now we know that um, if you have a lot of uh, heavy metal toxic, heavy metal toxicity, and other neural toxins, you have a much higher incidence or probability of getting neural problems. So you know we really have to detox. It's not just about eating vegetables and fish because even fish can be bad for you because of the heavy metal poisoning. Um, if vegetables could have toxins as well, if you're not sure it's organically grown because of the because of all of the um, pesticides, antibiotics, and other chemicals that they put in vegetables to give a higher yield, but at the same time you're taking all of those toxins. But you know we all live in the city; we don't all have the privilege of growing our own food. So we have, we're definitely going to take in the toxins. There's nothing you can do to avoid it. The toxins will come in, so will the heavy metals. So the best thing that you can do is make sure you have high, um, high content in your diet for antioxidants. And in my opinion, and well, this is shared with several other, other doctors, is that you want to look for things that are very high in uh, antioxidants. What are the kinds of fish that don't contain mercury? Um, you know, these are usually the pond fish. So they wouldn't have, uh, these are the, like tilapia, for example, wouldn't really have um, uh, mercury because it is farm grown. So there's no um, heavy metal toxicity that comes from the sea. And, you know, it's fresh water and the parameters of their breeding and growth is more controlled, but um, pro the problem there naman is antibiotics and all of the other chemicals that are associated with farm-grown um, livestock. Okay, let's move on. Um, make it a habit to eat probiotics that have healthy bacteria and enzymes to maximize absorption and prevent constipation. So this one is very important because um, well, I, I can't speak for the Chinese diet, but the Filipino diet is very, um, we, we don't have a lot of enzymes, you know. Um, so you want a lot of fermented food because fermented food has, it has those little microbi uh, microbiota that will help break down your food and the enzyme. See, like you can eat maybe two, three pounds of food every meal, but you can still be malnourished. It's not so much about what you put in your mouth, but also what you absorb into your muscles. You know, just because it's in the piping of your body doesn't mean it's part of your body. There's a big difference between what we take in and what we actually absorb. So 
if you want to help your digestive enzyme, your own digestive enzymes, it's always nice to take probiotics. Because probiotics, number one, it can prevent diseases and issues with your colon because the healthy bacteria, the population of that will prevent any growth of bad bacteria. So you're actually helping, this is how you help um, save your immune system because your immune system is helped by like a healthy army of good bacteria that's fighting on your side. So your immune system doesn't have to be loaded with fighting all of the bacteria outside and inside your digestive system. So it's always nice to take um, probiotics. Now, I wish I could get into the many types of probiotics that you should include into your diet. Um, yes, there are some uh, cream dory that are farm grown, but um, their growth is a little bit more tricky than say tilapia. So there's not too many farms that have that. Okay, so going back, um, please include probiotics. Like I said, I would love to go on more of a deep dive about probiotics, but it's a very, very long topic. So please do your research on it. And maybe later on, we can add a topic that's uh, specific for food. And then there we can go in deeper with uh, probiotics. But I could not stress enough to please take probiotics into your diet. Okay, next, practice intermittent fasting as often as possible. Even one meal a day, a few times a month promotes autophagy. Now, what is that word autophagy? That is one of the best things that's associated with intermittent fasting or just fasting in general. Um, it's not uncommon that you'll see that there is a fasting com component in almost every religion. You know, every ancient culture has had some sort of fasting integrated uh, with their practices. Because now science is starting to prove why fasting is so important. When you don't, when you don't eat, your body will start to autophage. So the word autophagy is autophage, which means to eat oneself. Now, I know that sounds a little bit scary that your body will start eating itself and cannibalizing itself, but it's really not bad. It's actually a very good thing because when your body starts eating itself and its own proteins and amino acids and collagen, it's not going to go after the healthy cells. It will eat the unhealthy old, broken, damaged cells. So every time you go on a fast, and usually after about 10 hours, your body starts to go into the process of ketosis, where your body will start subsisting mainly of ketones, which is a good source of energy, but doesn't um, damage your, insul uh, your insulin sensitivity. And then after that, you, got, you get your autophagy stage. In the autophagy stage, yung, your body parang wala na siyang makain, so it has to start eating itself. And it will always select the damaged cells. In fact, um, research on autophagy has linked it with um, slowing down cancer. Because when the body has nothing to eat to sustain itself, it will start going after not just damaged and old cells. It will also go after um, aberrant cells. So these are your cancer cells. These are the cells that don't follow their programming. So it can slowly chip away at the cancer cells to bring down the size of the tumor. And that, that's a very, very good thing. So it gives your body time and you know, it minimizes the size. So you, all of your systems can still keep functioning. So um, I'm not saying go on a hunger strike. Please don't do that. That's very dangerous. And before you do this fasting, please consult your doctor. Or if you don't want to go to the hospital right now, you, know, you can always do um, online consults. And, um, or if not, if you still don't want to do that, if you really want to just do fasting, it is safe enough to go into 
but please go into it very, very slowly. So first start with a 10 hour fast until a 12 hour fast, which is the circadian rhythm kind of fast. Meaning um, there are the most success of this type of fasting of 12 hours, this is called the circadian rhythm fast. So you only eat when there's sun. So as soon as the sun comes down by about six, depending on the time of the year, you don't eat anymore. Because in nature, long before we discovered buildings, electricity, and internet, you would, humans, the early humans, would only eat during the day. Because it's, a, you can't, it's very difficult to hunt and prepare your food when there's no sun, you know? So that's why they say it's good when in doubt, follow nature. And how did, na how did humans used to do it before we, were, before we perfected the indoors with our Netflix and our air one and our electricity? Try to follow that. And so they've been getting very good results with uh, circadian fasting. And that means fasting, um, eating only when the sun is out. So that's, that's, that's very important. Okay, uh, again, fasting is a very fascinating, exciting, and helpful topic for everybody. But, you know, we just simply don't have the time. So if I could just leave you with one suggestion, please start slow. And maybe once or twice a month, you can do uh, one meal a day. So at least you maximize your, um, your autophagy because autophagy is very good. Imagine it renews your cells. So you, I don't know if you've heard that it's healthy to donate blood, right? I don't know if everyone has heard that, but it, that is true. It's healthy to donate blood because let's say you donate um, 250 ml of blood and the body only has an average of about four and a half to five liters of blood. When you lose 250, then your body will make new blood. So that's good quality blood, right? If you didn't donate, then the body has no use for, um, it, it doesn't need to make new blood. So it's just the same old blood circulating the whole time. It stimulates rejuvenation is what I'm saying. That's why it's very good to have fasting integrated into your life and in your habits. Um, not only that, it improves the quality of your collagen. You'll notice that your joints will feel better because it will go after the damaged connective tissue first. So it will scour your entire body for sources of energy and it will use the aberrant, damaged, and old cells first. So you're renewing yourself. And also, one last point about fasting it uh, has been proven to lengthen your telomeres. Um, telomeres is what dictates your body's, uh, your DNA's ability to replicate itself. So the longer your telomeres, the better your, um, the better your chances of living longer, basically. So you can make better quality DNA copies um, if you have long telomeres. It's what protects the integrity of each strand of DNA. Okay. Sorry, that's, that was a lot. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so um, healthy eating plate. This is something that you might want to take a photo of. Use healthy oils like olive oil and canola oil for cooking on salad and at the table. Uh, limit butter, avoid trans fat. So one of the oils that I really like is MCT oil. These are also the medium chain triglycerides. Uh, you can buy this in, um, in healthy options, I believe. Um, so, or just ask your store. You can Google anytime, Facebook, MCT, medium chain triglycerides. It's a, it's a very good source of um, energy and it's clean. It, it, it gives your body almost all of the energy it needs for the day. Next, more veggies. And the greater the variety, the better. 
potatoes and french fries don't count because basically those are just carbs. So although potatoes are good, you know, it was associated more for suppressing hunger, but it doesn't have a lot of nutrients. Okay, um, fruits, eat plenty of fruits of all colors. So basically, depending on the color of the fruit, that's associated to different um, vitamins and minerals. Uh, drink water, tea, or coffee with little or no sugar. Because like I said, sugar is very, very, very bad. It's, it's worse than smoking. It's worse than drugs. Um, eat a variety of whole grains like whole wheat bread, whole grain pasta, and brown rice. Uh, limit refined grains like white rice and white bread. So the problem with white rice is it doesn't give you any roughage to help with your digestion and prevent constipation. And also it has reduced nutritional value. So if you can, please take brown rice or black rice. It might not taste as good, but it's a lot healthier for you. And also it makes you eat less. So it's great for people that are trying to lose weight. Um, healthy protein, choose fish, poultry, beans, and nuts. Limit red meat and cheese. Avoid bacon, cold cuts, and other processed meats. So the reason why we want to get rid of processed meats is um, there are, in processing food, the reason why you process food is so that hindi masira, it doesn't go bad. And, and if, it's one thing that I found to be very scary in my research was that, um, you know, in med school, we, we had cadavers. And um, so because we had to study the human body and then you will learn about all of the embalming chemicals that they use to preserve the body so that we can study it throughout the semester. And then I learned about processing meat. It was very interesting to me to learn that processed meat has a lot of the same chemicals in embalming fluid. So, you know, it, it's really not good for you. So please avoid processed meat as much as you can. So, you know, like those red hot dogs, those are absolutely terrible because there's a dye and it's, it's almost completely synthetic. There's hardly any protein and amino acids in it that you can really use well. So just, I'm not saying don't eat meat, but just, just um, minimize processed meat. Okay, let's uh, move on. I'm sorry, there were a few messages that would come in on the chat, but sometimes I miss it. So I'll just go, I'll just go back to it later when, when we're in our uh, Q&A portion. All right, next slide, sleep. Uh, okay, this one's very, very, very important. Um, again, this should be its own topic for one semester, but we'll try to condense it in a few minutes. Try to maintain seven to nine, seven to nine hours of quality sleep. Now, I know as we get older, we sleep, we start to sleep less. And even I, at my age now of, uh, I'll be 39 this year, um, I've noticed that I'm sleeping a lot less. Maybe it's because uh, we had a baby and he keeps waking us up. But generally, as we get older, we sleep less. But that doesn't mean you're very unhealthy. What you want to see there is in the second point, quality deep sleep is better than a long duration. So you have the best repair when you have prolonged stage two and stage three of deep sleep. So you generally have five stages of sleep, which is the first stage is falling asleep. Second stage is uh, light sleep or shallow sleep. And then, um, yeah, so you're, you're stage two and three, this is when you heal. And then the other one is, so what is um, a good deep sleep? This is sleep where it's just rest and you're not dreaming. The REM stage or the rapid eye movement stage is associated with the dreaming phase. So this, I mean, although you can rest and repair, this is a phase of sleep that um, you don't heal as much as um, deep stage two and stage three. So let's go over it again. Falling asleep, 
um, light sleep and then deep sleep. So that's the nice one without any dreams. And then I'm forgetting a couple of stages, but REM is not as, not as good quality. So you want to prolong your uh, stage, uh, stage two and three as much as possible. Sorry, I missed the text again, but I will go back to it. Check if you have sleep apnea or other sleep disorders. Do a sleep study if you have, do, if you have doubts. Um, so one of the things that prevent us to get to deep sleep is if we have sleep apnea. So the ones that snore very loud, these people are not getting deep sleep. So, you know, sometimes it could just be a simple mouth guard that they'll put or because another symptom of uh, sleep disorder is grinding your teeth at night. Um, so that's a bad sign, which means there's a lot of anxiety and stress and you're grinding your teeth at night. Um, another um, bad sleep disorder is, like I said, sleep apnea. This is when your blood oxygen dips because you can't breathe. So people that are overweight or morbidly overweight uh, usually have this problem. They sleep louder because of the fat deposits in their neck restricting airflow. Um, so like I said, if you have any doubts, please do a sleep study so that um, you can know for sure if your health is suffering from your sleep. Because, you know, some people, imagine this is one third of your life, sleep. And this is when you do all of your repairing. If you're not doing it right, think about what it will do to your your life in the long long term so it's very 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 important that you get good quality sleep so please ask the people that you sleep with or if you sleep alone have one day to be monitored by a sleep study because it's very important this can mean how long you're going to live and how well you will live because when we sleep that's when we repair i could not stress enough how important sleep is so um, if you want to have it done, I believe there are three sleep centers here in Manila, one in Quezon City, but you can always Google it. Um, I can help you find it and refer you if you need it. But this is very, very important. You know, we've all experienced when you wake up and then you've had like eight to 10 hours, but you wake up and then you feel like you're still so tired. This is because you didn't get a long period of time in that deep sleep where you feel repaired. And another uh, footnote is when we sleep, this is when a component of our blood called hemoglobin regenerates. So hemoglobin directly affects the oxygen or gas carrying capacity of our blood. And the whole purpose of our blood is to bring carb, um, oxygen to our tissues bring it to our heart, bring it to our muscles. It's our blood that brings it there. And our blood is able to do that thanks to hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is regenerated when we sleep. So if you don't sleep well, your oxygen carrying capacity is affected and you can only imagine what that will do to you in the long term. So um, in addition to getting sleep studies, what can you do? Um, for if you have problems with going to sleep, uh, you number one, try to get rid of cell phones in bed if you have problems sleeping. Just do not have cell phones in bed. Uh, leave it outside, no tablet, no iPad, no Kindle, or whatever gadget. And this goes for your children and your ch grandchildren as well. So Sleep is super duper important and it's alarming how much people have sleep disorders now. Throughout this pandemic, someone did uh, a study and during this pandemic, we had record highs of uh, reports of sleep disorders. So the sad part about this pandemic <coughs> is that we're gonna come out of the pandemic with a much less healthy population than ever before. Um, so yeah, one, no gadget in bed because it keeps your mind stimulated. 
excuse me. Um, my professor once told me that the bed should only have two functions in your life. One of the functions is sleep. I, I won't talk about the other one. Um, keep it as dark as possible um, because <coughs> you have something like something called um, melatonin, which is released only in the dark. It's also, it's Greek actually for the darkness hormone. Um, another thing, so use uh, blackout curtains if you have to, because your retina and your skin has, uh, has light receptors that uh, will let your body know if it's dark or not. Um, maintain a, the temperature as, as cold as possible, or at least as comfortable as you can make it. Because when, you're ha when you have a temperature of about 19 to 22 Celsius, this makes your metabolism slow, slow down. And cold actually helps us fall asleep. Um, when people say that they can just use an eye cover to be able to fall asleep better, this doesn't work because you don't just have light sensors in your eyes. You also have it in your skin. So that's why if you go out into the beach too long, you'll get a tan like, like that. So you have receptors. Your body knows when it's dark, not just your eyes. Okay, let's move on. All right. Okay, our next topic is hydration. Uh, you want to drink at least two liters of water per day and make sure you do not drink large, of, uh, large amounts of liquid during meals. Why? Unfortunately, during meals is when we usually drink the most amount of water, but we shouldn't do that. Or worse, it'll be the time when you drink soda and high sugar drinks. Now, this is really not a good idea because if you drink a lot of water during your meals, it will dilute the acids that you need to break down that food. Um, so you should be drinking water throughout the day, not just all concentrated during meals because you're also getting water from the food that you're taking. You know, like when you drink, when you eat soup, uh, when you drink soup, when you rice has water it's mostly water right um even the beef or the pork the fish it all has water so you're already getting hydration from that please limit your liquid intake during meals without sugar and minimize the liquid volume because it will dilute the acids in your stomach and your body will have to produce even more acid so later on this could lead to hyperacidity and other problems so drink less at night to avoid getting up late to urinate and it will disrupt your sleep pattern, preventing you from going into a deep uh, level of sleep. Uh, next is also always check your urine for smell and color because the smell and color of your urine will indicate if you are dehydrated or not. If you have, you know, look at your urine. In school, we're taught this. When you look at your urine, if you see there's a lot of bubbles, there could be proteinuria. This, you see if there's any like um, darkness in your in your urine. You know, you are you don't have to go to HP diagnostics all the time. Your urine will actually provide so much diagnostic tools. The color of the white in your eye. If it's very white, that means you're healthy. Very good. If it's red or yellowish, it could mean a yellow. Pro um, uh, it could mean a liver problem. Look at your nails. Is your nails smooth? If there are ridges, this could mean a deficiency in something. Um, look at your tongue. If there's a lot of scarring and ridges, this could mean uh, you're chronically dehydrated. You have an inflammatory issue. With the urine, the pungent smell, if, it's, uh, if it smells bad, that means your body is not metabolizing the ammonia very well. If 
it's very dark, it could mean you're dehydrated. If there's bubbles, it could mean there's protein in your urine. If there are dark striations, it could mean there's blood in your urine that could be an indicator for maybe a kidney problem. So please always check your urine for diagnostics. And if you have any of the things that I mentioned, please see your doctor and get a CBC and urinalysis. Okay, so what does, the, what does good hydration do for you? It moistens the tissues in the eyes, nose, and mouth. Also, if you don't drink enough water, you cannot absorb oxygen and you cannot liberate carbon dioxide because oxygen has to bond to the hemoglobin and the hemoglobin cannot hold on to the oxygen molecules if it's not moist. So I always use as an example, if you had sand, let's say you're at the beach, there's sand. And then if your hand is dry, if you put your hand on the sand and you lift up your hand, quanti lang yung sand. But imagine if your hand is wet and then you put your hand on the sand, and then you bring it up, you'll see that your hand is super covered with sand because the liquid helps with surface tension to hold on to the sand molecules. It's the same thing with our lungs. You cannot have proper gas exchange. You cannot get oxygen if you are dehydrated. That's why your lungs has to be always well hydrated. Uh, it protects organs and tissues, helps, helps prevent and relieve constipation. Sometimes people that are chron um, chronically constipated, these are people that don't poop every day. Um, they sometimes are just as simple as dehydrated. Um, your, your, the liquids also help dissolve and deliver nutrients to different parts of your body. It assists the body in the regulation of temperature, provides lubrication to joints, uh, supports the kidney and liver health by flushing away toxins. So basically, we are 65 to 70% water. If you don't drink enough water, the first thing that will suffer is your joints because the body will give the assets or resources to organs essential to life first. The joints are not essential to life. So that's why if you have a lot of joint pain, the first thing that I would look at is, are you drinking enough water? Because if you're not drinking enough water, the body will give whatever water you do drink and it'll give it to the organs to keep you alive. But what will suffer and won't get any or hardly any is your joints. So I, like again, uh, oxygen needs water to go around your body. All right, so that does it for hydration. Moving on. Okay, exercise and stretching. So again, this should be its own separate thing, but we'll do a little uh, condensed. <laughs> exercises, or I could probably send Sister Juliet a YouTube video that would be safe for any age. Okay, so what kind of exercise and stretching should we do? Should it be at least 30 minutes a day, four days a week. Uh, you know, these, these recommendations are always being modified by the American Medical Association and the Philippine Medical Association. So um, now they say it's 30 minutes a day, four days a week. Um, also, please make sure you get clearance from your doctor if on how intense you can go. Because no matter what your condition, even if you were just in bed, everybody needs to do some form of exercise. The only thing you really need clearance about is how much intensity. Because in many cases, the kind of exercise will be limited to your strength and range of motion. The more important thing to get clearance for is the kind of intensity because we don't want to have any cardiovascular incidents. So please get clearance and monitor your blood pressure before you start doing any exercises. If you have no restrictions, try to do at least 20 minutes of moderate cardio per day. 
Um, so this is well, by moderate cardio. This is about forty percent higher than your resting heart rate or your resting uh, blood pressure. So if you could make your blood pressure go to about um, one forty, again get um, clearance first from your doctor because when you increase the blood pressure your body will flush more blood through the pipes and it will stretch your blood vessels. When you stretch your blood vessels, you prevent any plaque from uh, growing inside the walls. And if there's a buildup of, or hardening of the blood vessels, this will also stretch it out and dislodge any hardening or plaque that has settled in your blood vessels. So, you know, exercise is not just for looking good. You know, some, some of my patients say, I don't want to exercise because, you know, I'm, I'm older now and I don't need to look good anymore. First of all, that's not true. Everybody should always try to look good, um, no matter what your age. But more importantly, exercise is important in keeping your heart and your blood vessels healthy. Okay, it's about your, your blood vessels' ability to respond to stress. It has to be able to expand when there's uh, when there's a lot of pressure, and it has to be able to come down when there's not too much pressure. If you spend your whole time and your whole life not exercising, and your blood vessels are just like this, then it gas in blood vessel. It won't lose the ability to do that anymore. And then one day, a stressful environment or bad news comes and then biglang your heart starts pumping really hard and then it will try to expand what happens. Maybe there's a rupture, you could get an aneurysm, stroke, heart attack, any one of these things. Or maybe there's an embolism. These are like clots that form in your blood vessels that get dislodged by a sudden high uh, force of blood. You could have a, uh, an embolism and die almost immediately. So it's really, really important to challenge your heart, but you build on it very slowly. So, you know, they say that that's the reason why people that don't have problems will fabricate problems. You know, like, let's say your life is perfect and, you know, you don't have to worry about putting food on the table. You don't have to worry about, your kids because they're big already, there's no more problems. You know, you're set financially, you, you live in a good environment and you have no more problem. So what happens? You start to make problems. You know, it's, it's inherent in humans to make these problems because we need to constantly overcome challenges. And these challenges have a direct link to our physical health. You know, so like, to someone that has, or maybe if you're a CEO or someone that has a very high stress job, if I take this cup and then maybe the yaya breaks it while uh, cleaning, someone with a lot of problems won't care. I'm like, okay, fine, we'll just buy a new glass. But if you don't have problems, you're going to take that little thing like a broken cup. And then you're going to make a big deal out of it, you know? And like, oh my gosh, why is this Why is this helper like this? Why is she like that? Da, 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 da. She keeps breaking things. You'll make a mountain out of a molehill because your body is craving the challenge. Your body is trying to spike the blood pressure. Just like um, in life, we need to constantly have struggle and surpass them beat those challenges it makes us better people it also makes our bodies healthier our bodies need to pump the heart needs to pump hard so it will clear and clean it okay so you know challenges are a good thing it keeps us mentally and physically healthy so when our blood pressure goes up you know as we get older in fact even with this happened with my own family my my mom never wanted us to give any bad news to our guama because baka daw tumaas yung blood pressure because everyone was scared of that but you know now that i'm a doctor i've learned that getting the blood pressure up sometimes is good it actually makes 
it helps keep your, your base blood pressure low when you have times when you spike your blood pressure. You have to challenge your heart, challenge your mind. Okay, sorry, I, I've been going on and on. I'll, I'll try to move on. Uh, so if no, no restrictions are given, try to do at least 20 minutes of moderate cardio per day. Okay, next, um, compound body weight exercise is best. So, you know, try not to go to the gym first and start carrying the heavy weights because you are more liable to get injured. If you just build on your body weight by increasing more reps, that's much safer. And when you do choose your exercises, because some people like Zumba, you know, some people like swimming. It, it's really a personality preference. But when you do choose your exercise, because we should all have exercise, make sure that it is the kind of exercises, exercise that gives a lot of range of motion. Okay, the more range of motion, the better. So there. Yeah. Next, make sure to stretch after and never before an exercise. Uh, we grew up thinking that we have to stretch before, right? You even used to all do it in PE, the stretching, all of that. That's wrong. Do not do stretching before the activity. You should do it in the end because you'll get hurt and you'll reduce your functionality and efficiency. You have to warm up. Warm up exactly like uh, Elmer said. Warm up first. That's the most important. Um, maybe you can do stretching after you warm up, but definitely don't do stretching first. And don't think that stretching is a substitute for warm up, or stretching is the warm up. That's not it at all. Okay, stretching is its own thing, and uh, it's done in the end um, or in the middle. After basically your your muscles are already nice and lubricated and you're warmed up. Um, stretching is about gradual connective tissue growth or lengthening. So do not do fast and pulsing stretches. So you know you the, the stretches that we were taught before. You know those Jane Fonda stuff. That doesn't help. Um, you want to do nice long, big range of motion stretches and very slow. Feel your connective tissue lengthening. Feel your organs decompress and stretch out. You're not going to feel any of that if you, if you start pulsing and trying to touch your toes. That's why I'm a big fan of uh, Tai Chi and Qigong because it's, it's nice and slow. So that's, that's the best thing to do there. Uh, there was one more point I wanted to do with uh, stretching. And that is uh, exercise. Okay, so we, we really need to exercise because you know how you notice some people, they'll say that people that exercise have a better mood, okay? Because when you exercise, you get more endorphins to counteract the little tears that you do on your muscles. So it stimulates, it's like autophagy. It stimulates your body to repair and renew. It's good to do that. Number two, it's, it secretes those feel-good hormones that elevate your mood. So when you exercise, it will improve your everything, your personality, your blood pressure. It will make you happier. If you don't exercise, even if really good things are happening to you, you can't appreciate it. So please make sure to add that into your life. Yeah. Okay, next is uh, posture and balance. And this one, I think I would like to talk, to, uh, talk about more ergonomics than anything else. Um, so we should invest in good quality mattresses, shares, and I wanna add shoes. Shoes is very, 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 very important. I can uh, give you a list of good mattresses, good chairs, and good shoes. Uh, most recently, I think maybe a month ago, I was going through this thing. Uh, Uncle Dr. Andrew Luson and I were talking about what's the best chairs because I don't want to throw Uncle Andrew under the bus here, but he wasn't using a very good chair. So, you know, it, because now we're doing more Zoom, sitting down longer than ever. So please, 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 please invest in a good mattress, good chairs, and good shoes. 
Okay, be mindful of your posture as you stand, sit, or lay down. How do you know if you're sitting well? People ask me all the time, what's the proper posture when lying down? What side should I lie down in? What, how should I sit on my chair? The point is to, it's different for everyone, but the core principle is you have to make sure that you minimize the angles. You minimize compression on your organs. And to, minim, uh, to make sure that you don't have any problems, you make sure you give as much surface area of you or your weight to the furniture. You give as much of that as possible. So if you sit, sorry, I'm just gonna tilt this down a little bit. So if you sit like this, slouched, you have an angle on your neck because your your head has to face up still. So if you give more of your body to the chair, that will decrease the points of pressure, and that will decrease. Um, parts where you can build plaque in your blood vessels. So please, when you sit down, there's no real one way that's a good way to sit. It's not about putting uh, so much a lumbar support or anything. It's basically give as much of yourself to the chair as possible. So when you're on a chair, sit all the way back. Don't just sit at the edge of the chair or don't slouch because that space between the chair and your body, that triangle there, that will put a lot of strain on your spine and your back muscle. And it will make you curl and it will compress your organs. Uh, next, position the screen as high as possible. So like for me, even in, our, um, even in our living room, I make sure that TV is mounted. Or in this case, I, it's a projector. Um, it's high, it's large to make sure that you know, you don't do this. We're always like this. Our life is always stooped down and bending. So, you know, same thing. When, you, when I use my phone, I try to have it up high, like this. If you do it down low like this, then you're always going to be bending here. You'll be restricting your thyroid, so you affect your hormones. You'll be giving yourself problems with uh, your your airway passage as well. You, you reduce the amount of oxygen, not just your hormones are affected. Also your oxygen uh, or your gas exchange is affected when you're always stooped down. Not to mention the musculoskeletal pain. So um, invest in bigger screens. This is great news for the men out there because now I'm officially giving you a reason to buy a bigger TV. Because it's better for your neck, it's better for your lungs, it's better for your eyes. The bigger, the better. You can scrimp on the quality of the panel, but please make it as big as possible so you don't strain and you don't arch, you don't crane. Um, so even me with my laptop, I never use the keyboard with the laptop. I don't, I don't use it like this. I always have an external keyboard that will make the screen far and high. So I can position this, the laptop higher or the tablet higher. So another thing to invest in is an external keyboard and mouse. <coughs> okay, um, keep an eye on the compression angles on your body. So when you're sitting down, try to see, are the angles very sharp or is it open? Because whenever there are sharp angles in your body, whether it be on your knees or on your hips, these are areas where you can have pain, inflammation, and damage. So you want to make sure there's no sharp angles as you lie down. And as much of the surface area and weight of your body is distributed as much as possible. Because every chair is different. Every, every person is different. But what's universal is how much of yourself, how you use it. Um, I was told, wala sa Indian yan, wala sa pana yan, nasa Indian. So it's not the equipment, it's the person using it. Um, next is avoid sitting for over an hour, which we've all already done. So I don't know, maybe we should uh, 
very soon take a quick break to stand up and stretch. It could be as easy as one minute. So uh, what you can do is just, what, what I like to do is just bend backwards like that. Just a quick bend and look up also, make sure you gaze up. So it, it's just that simple. Uh, wait, one second, sorry. Okay, um, try to stand and stretch every 45 minutes. So, you know, even in the hospital, if we have like a comatose patient, we will make sure we try to move them at least every four hours so to avoid bed sores. Okay. So my last point there is quality over savings. Doctors in surgery are more expensive than quality furniture, appliances, and shoes. So please make it a point. You can, you can save and make the bid on almost everything else, but make sure you go for quality when it comes to your mattress, your chair, and your shoes. Okay. Next. Okay, so th this one is, an, is a good example. You see how this guy sitting down has no sharp angles as he sits, okay? I mean, of course he can't work this way, but if he sits up, just make sure your upper back is contacting the chair. You know, you just want to minimize the angles. So if you can imagine here what's going on with this um, organs, this way nothing is compressed. If you sit slouched forward, now what I'm so afraid of are the kids. They're becoming more and more unhealthy because of all of this Zoom classes. And, you know, 99% of the kids will be sitting with really bad posture, super compressed, organs compressed, liver compressed. And then they wonder why they have constipation. They wonder why they have hyperacidity. They wonder why they have uh, absorption problems. It's because they're, not, they're sitting down too long and too curved. You wanna minimize it, open up. So please invest in good chairs and make sure you use it wisely. And by using it wisely, I mean, give as much of your surface area and weight to the chair as possible, minimizing the, the sharp angles. Whenever you have sharp angles, you also have organ and blood vessel compression. Moving on. Next, uh, mental health. I think this might be the last topic. Um, mental health, uh, community keeps our mind and soul healthy. Um, that's why I really love MGC to the bottom of my heart because I think it has saved me many times. It has certainly gotten my marriage started on the right foot thanks to uh, Boksu and giving me really good advice just when I started the marriage. And I got such great advice from um, Auntie Grace Ong, um, Juliet, of course, uh, Boksu Hard, um, Uncle Andrew, uh, Auntie Julie, Auntie Judy, you son, Auntie, Auntie Grace, you son. You know, I got so much good advice. And I think that's why I didn't go crazy when I realized how hard it is pala to be married and how hard it is to be in my position when the pandemic hit, you know, and how I got so much good advice. Like when my mom got sick and when, my, when we lost my mom, I wouldn't have been able to survive that. I would have totally lost my mind if it wasn't for people right here in MGC. It's why it's important to surround yourself with community. Sometimes we might not get along very well with people in our community or in our church, but it's important to stay at it and, you know, work through our problems, our, our social conflict. Because the alternative is to be alone. And if you do that, that's almost the quickest way to go insane, especially in times like now. There's so much fear, uncertainty, and doubt. 
there's so much hate. And the only way to combat that is by, you know, maintaining the community. You help yourself by helping others. And the only way to do that is to be part of a community. Um, I strongly recommend if, if uh, you have the time to please read the book called Ikigai. Uh, Ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I, -I -I, Ikigai. It's a very good book and it talks about how important community is, exercise. Yeah, that's right. Elmer, thank you for that. There's the spelling, Ikigai. So please, if you can read that book, it, it was very helpful for me as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it can explain it much better than I can. I'm more of a clinician really rather than a speaker. Okay, uh, next exercise directly affects our mental health. I discussed that earlier. It, it gives us happy hormones. It um, gives us a sense of well being. So we have a much better mood. Uh, movement and coordination prevents dementia. Now, this is a topic I always like to discuss. You can read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. And you can catch, you can play catch for five minutes, okay? Playing catch for five minutes uses more neurons and makes more brain activity than reading the entire encyclopedia. So as much as it's very good to memorize poems uh, and to challenge your mind, the thing that challenges your mind the most is doing physical dexterity exercises. You know, when you play catch, your mind is making millions and millions of calculations every millisecond to make your hand intercept and prepare for the weight of the object. And that makes so much more brain activity than just reading. So um, there's a lot to be said about kinetic intelligence. Um, you know, when they said that athletes are just dumb jocks, actually not true. It, it takes a lot of mental power to be in sports. So, you know, try to do something physical, something that involves dexterity and skill so that you make sure you don't have dementia. You know, they say dementia is one of the worst things to have because, you know, instead of just dying, you slowly waste away and you become robbed of the memories of the amazing life that you had in the past. And it, it you know, it, it, um, it's very hard on the family to see. So if you don't want yourself and your family to go through that, please make it a point to do physical exercise. Uh, all right. I just uh, <laughs> I just saw a photo of uh, Pastor June Go, and he has a gigantic TV. Well done, Pastor June. That's good. And please mount it a little bit higher. Okay. Next, uh, try to learn a new skill that involves memorization and dexterity as often as you can. So the other thing that keeps our mind sharp is learning and doing new things. You know, if you just keep on doing the same stuff over and over again, your brain will get lazy. So try to challenge yourself. If you have a community like the Evergreen community of, of uh, MGC, it's nice that you're having these lectures, you know, and share some information. And it's also going to be nice if you share physical activities whenever, hopefully by... Um, end of the year or early next year, we can start seeing each other face to face again, and we can start doing skills, new, new skills, new dexterity exercises. Um, there. And then this is an, the next one is a weird tip I'd like to give you, which is to keep up with the language of the youth. You know, there's so many vocabulary things that you could learn, like uh, FOMO, LOL, and all of that stuff. I don't know why they like to speak in acronyms, but if you keep up with um, your grandkids or your kids in their lingo and how they talk, it makes you closer to them because language is really what connects people. Uh, 
Gen Z language is the, is the next challenge. Yes, that's a, that's a super big challenge because even I don't understand it. I feel like a, I feel like a dinosaur sometimes when I'm talking to my nephew and niece. Basically, because it's so weird, you know, their, their language is so weird. But in the process of doing so, we get to smile and laugh. Maybe they'll make fun of me a little bit. Maybe I'll make fun of them. But either way, it's a lot of smiles and a lot of laughs. And laughter is the best way to exercise your diaphragm. Uh, and it floods your body with happy hormones. So try to make it a point to smile and laugh every day. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll get to that, Esther, yeah. the question soon. So there, it, one of the best exercises is laughter. And learning new things is also really nice and connecting with people. That's why I gave the tip to try to learn the Gen Z language. It's ridiculous, it's hilarious, but everyone will have a good time. <laughs> And it's great exercise for your diaphragm. All right, next. Okay, so I guess that's it. Thank you very much for listening.